It doesn't matter if you're new to hacking or you're simply using the internet on a daily basis. Those are the 5 attacks you should know about and be wary of the dangers. Hi guys, my name is Kostadin, this is Bullhack and today we're going to be learning about the most relevant attacks that are happening right now. We're currently witnessing a lot of cyber attacks in specific to denial of service that impact our lifestyle directly and indirectly. But what exactly is denial of service? This is when an attacker sends a lot of data packets to a service and in doing so it prevents that service to process any other legitimate data that is coming to it or going out from it. So you can imagine it as having a tube that the whole communication, the whole traffic is going into that space, that closed space. And imagine an attacker sending a lot of information through that closed space and filling it up to an extent where any other traffic that's trying to go into that tube cannot really fit in because there's so much data in already. So it's clogged in a way. This is exactly what um, denial of service is because the legitimate data cannot get to the service on the other end of the tube. So there are two types of denial of service, a distributed denial of service attack and a normal denial of service. The normal denial of service is when we have a single system attacking another system or service. The distributed is when the attacker controls thousands of devices. It could be tens, it could be thousands, it could be millions of devices. He can send a command towards those devices to command them to initiate an attack against a single service, therefore clogging that information line. So this type of attack can be really destructive. Imagine filling a balloon with a lot of air. That balloon is gonna explode because of the pressure. That could happen to a system that is under a denial of service attack. It could lead to crash, loss of data. It could lead to systems being corrupted, that's a huge impact against businesses, against your data. It's really hard to, to prevent it in a way. As an example of such an attack, could be given Operation Payback that was conducted by the hacktivist group Anonymous a little while ago. A hacktivist, real quick, is someone who is using his knowledge in hacking to protest against an organization. However, he is using it in a destructive way. Of course, we do not really want that. We, as ethical hackers, do not condone that type of behavior. Anyway, so they managed to bring down critical systems and cause a little bit of chaos for a while. The primary ways to cause a denial of service are, firstly, when you have a vulnerability that is within the configuration of the system, which allows for an attacker, when exploiting that vulnerability, to cause denial of service. And the second way is for an attacker to launch a specific attack by sending a lot of packets, data packets, against the system. And the same thing that I explained earlier. Those are the two primary ways to cause denial of service. Sometimes lack of bandwidth could cause denial of service. And this is a, just simply a misconfiguration. Now let's talk about malware. Malware can be seen as a malicious code or a piece of software that is intended for malicious use. What do you mean? A software can, for example, it could be a calculator, you know, you can use it to calculate things. It could be anything else. But a malware is a software that is used with malicious purposes. For example, it could destroy data, it could encrypt it, it could, for example, spy on your system. That said, there are different types of malware. A malware could be called ransomware. A ransomware is exactly that piece of software that would encrypt your entire data and then extort you for money in order for you to get access to retrieve back the original state of your data by providing you with a key. For example, just imagine you download a picture, that picture contains some virus, a ransomware. You click on it and then that script would encrypt with a private key which you don't really know so there is no way for you to decrypt back your data and um, what happens next is you lose access to your files to your data and when you're a business or you simply uh, have a lot of sensitive data that you need in your daily day-to-day -day tasks 
you no longer have it. Now that piece of software holds the key to your data and it wants you to pay some money to ransom it. It's pretty nasty, so you should be really, really careful what type of software you download, where you download it, be careful what type of emails you open and what type of files you download from your emails. Always try to check your files before opening them. If you have an antivirus system, if you don't, you can use Virus Toto, for example. It's located probably here. Another thing about ransomware that you really need to know about is firstly, in most countries, it is illegal. It is actually illegal to pay the um, hacking group to retrieve your files because this is how you finance crime. This is how they stay motivated to continue doing what they do. Another thing that should be also mentioned, be cautious when paying those groups because there is nothing that can guarantee that they will give you the access back to your files. You may pay uh, 1000 euros, you can pay 200 euros. In some cases, the price could get to a couple million. So there are no guarantees. Let's skip to the next one, which is quite interesting. It's called Trojan. The Trojan, probably you have heard it before because it's quite relevant and it's not new so a type of uh, malicious software. It's one of the first types actually. It is a type of software that could have a full control or semi control over your system depending on how silent the software has been configured to be. By noisy, I mean how easy it is for an antivirus system to detect that specific malicious software. A Trojan is often seen as a spying software because it is perfect at what it does and meaning spying. It could install key walkers on your system where the hackers can track all the keys that you click or type Therefore, they can extract sensitive data from your correspondence, websites that you visit, etc. They can also look at your screen in real time. They can take screenshots of your screen. They can see in real time what you do currently on your desktop. It's quite scary, you know. A Trojan usually is, it looks like a normal program. It could be embedded into a PDF file, into a Word document, into Excel. It doesn't matter. Any type of file could be embedded into another type of file. Not only that, but on Windows, there, there are many ways to actually hide the extension, the real extension of the file that we are running. Always try to inspect the properties of the file. Is it really a picture or is it something else like an executable? Because there are ways to bypass that uh, purely visually. There are ways to trick you into thinking it is a PDF or it is an image file while it is actually an executable. And when you open that image, you will see the, the image, but before opening the image for just a click of a second, it will actually execute a script that will install this malicious software. It will integrate itself within the processes and then it will be actually hard to get rid of it. Always be mindful what type of software you install, you open. Before opening a software that you have just downloaded from the internet, it doesn't matter where and from which website, always check it for viruses. It uh, does not provide you 100% protection because a virus could be encrypted. Therefore, the antivirus cannot really understand if it is a virus or not, but it gives you a better chance to survive such an attack. Now I would like to move on to a little bit different attack that is quite relevant nowadays and it always will be relevant until we have passwords and password protected files. It is called brute force attack where we have an attacker that is trying to guess out the credentials, the username or the password or both. There are three primary types of brute forcing. Dictionary attack where hacker is going to generate millions of combinations of words, symbols, numbers, and he's going to create his own customized word list that he's going to use to brute force possible combinations of passwords and usernames. In this type of attack, a hacker relies on a weak password with few symbols, few numbers, few smaller length of password, for example, less than 10 symbols. Then we have a credential recycling attack where the attacker is also going to use a word list, 
However, the word list is not generated by himself. That's actually a word list containing usernames and passwords of already breached or compromised credentials from previous data breaches that happened in the past. So that is a type of information that is actually sold on darknet, dark web, whatever you want to name it. And uh, it's actually quite accessible. It's not that expensive to buy a word list of 11 million people, for example. I mean, there are multiple word lists already available for free. So in credential recycling, we have an attacker who is going to use that type of word list to compromise your credentials if you are using a weak password or a generic username. The third type of brute forcing is reversing. The reversing is actually where it's actually quite fun because you don't really need to brute force the password. You just pick one password that statistically is proven to be used quite often. I have seen a lot of passwords such as password123 dot, but the A is with at, you know? So that type of password is actually <laughs> quite used in the open space. So what an attacker would try to do is he's going to use that password, but instead brute force usernames and when he uh, sees a username that uses that password, then he's going to log into his account. So that's a reversing. Now I would like to introduce you to man in the middle attacks. Man in the middle is actually quite accurately said. It is literally positioning yourself in between the traffic or the communication of two systems. For example, you have a system here, a system here. They're communicating and this is the line of communication. A man in the middle attack positions the attacker in between those two systems. Therefore, he can intercept the communication and if there is not enough encryption, if there are vulnerable services that use vulnerable hashing or encryption algorithms, then that attacker could extract sensitive data or manipulate the data that is going from and to those two systems. Let me provide you with an example for a man in the middle attack. In one of our future videos, we're going to showcase a hardware called Pineapple Mark 7. It is a USB driven device which emulates a wireless endpoint. It emulates all in range surrounding routers and it forces your device, such as a phone, a laptop, anything that wants to connect to the Wi Fi, to connect to the malicious endpoint, in this case, the Pineapple Mark 7. When your device connects to it, gets access to the internet. But the malicious router stands in between the traffic, in between your phone and, for example, the servers for Facebook or YouTube or whatever website, web application or online service that you're using. By positioning itself in the middle, it can analyze the traffic, it can launch attacks against your device, tries to compromise it or to extract sensitive data from it, from the traffic. So you have to be really, really careful to what endpoints you're connecting to. If any warning messages appear, you should be really careful to analyze them. Is this uh, certificate valid? Why is it not valid? Is it compromised? Check your endpoint. Is it the real one? An attacker could also launch advanced social engineering attacks against those two systems because behind those systems are actually people. In most cases, attackers use men in the middle attack to conduct social engineering. Social engineering is actually really, really interesting and deep subject. I'm not going to be able to really cover it all or even half of it, but let's try to figure out what is social engineering. Social engineering is probably the bread and butter of hacking. Hackers can try to hack systems, but sometimes systems are really, really well configured. They have security controls, security layers, and sometimes, most times actually, nine out of 10 times, a hacker would enter or compromise a system through the person. That could happen in a lot of ways. There are numerous, numerous types of social engineering that could occur. Some of those are vishing when a hacker is using voice over IP or is calling you on your phone. Smishing when the attacker is using SMS services, SMS messaging services I mean, to send you malicious text or 
to try to bait you into doing something that would compromise your system or phone. Fishing and spear phishing. There are multiple types of phishing. It's generally when an attacker is using the email platform to send you malicious email to try to compromise your system or data. How that can be achieved? Well, imagine a hacker collecting data about the people working for business A and then selecting, when talking about spear phishing at least, selecting specific person of interest. Let's say the chief executive officer. We know his type of work, his partners, his services, uh, his business process. We can craft specially crafted email message towards that specific person that looks legitimate and it is quite believable to bait that person to do something silly like downloading a file, opening a link that could lead to a malicious web application. In some of our future videos we're going to be showing you how you can do that and what are the dangers. Stay tuned for more. There is also physical social engineering. When we are disguising your, ourselves to bypass security, physical security layers, controls, like um, front desk people or security guard, RFID card. There are multiple tools that can allow you to bypass those security controls. It's quite interesting. I'm telling you, social engineering is my passion. In this channel, we're gonna try to emphasize on social engineering and just how cool it is. To summarize, always scan the downloaded files with virus total and your antivirus and similar alternative if you find one. Always have strong password, at least 16 characters, symbols, numbers, anything. Do not proceed when your browser warns you of an invalid SSL certificate. It is usually what protects your data when it is in transit. Be mindful of what wireless endpoints you connect to. Sometimes it can seem that you're connected to the correct endpoint, but you aren't in reality. You can check it from your wireless settings if you are actually connected to the correct endpoint. And if you aren't, then proceed to actually disconnecting because you're putting your data in danger and your device as well. All right, guys, thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed our content, please like it, subscribe, ring the bell. If you have any queries or questions, please share them in the comments. We'll try to answer them for you. And with that said, see you in our next video.